Hi, what you're about to see is an interview with uh, a vendor in the space in, in and around Data Mesh. We'd like to thank Nick Hudecker for uh, graciously doing these interviews with vendors. We would also like to make it clear that the Data Mesh community and Data Mesh Learning doesn't necessarily endorse anything that these vendors are, are talking about, but that we wanted to give them a voice to talk about what they may offer in the space um, so people are aware of vendors because obviously if everybody has to build everything themselves, uh, the data mesh is going to be pretty hard. So with that, we really thank uh, Nick for doing this great work and we hope that this is uh, good and useful to you. Uh, all right, so I'm Nick Hudecker, uh, former Gartner analyst and now uh, Senior Director of Market Strategy and Competitive Intelligence at Cribble. Uh, if you don't know Cribble, we are the observability pipeline company, um, very active in the, in the observability space. Uh, our product log stream sits between sources and destinations of observability data. So like events, logs, metrics, traces, uh, and we abstract out you know, how you can send data from those sources to multiple destinations. Um, and today I'm joined, this is my first data management learning session. Um, I'm joined by uh, Chris and Ying Han from Tetman. Uh, so, hey guys, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, why don't you go do a quick interview or sorry, interview, uh, introduction. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, thanks, All Nick. Right. Are you Ying Han? Sure. Uh, thanks, Nick, for, for inviting Chris and myself. So uh, Chris and I, myself, we founded Tetmon in uh, 2019 uh, to work on data integration, but uh, we had been working on uh, like some doing services in the data space, in the DevOps space uh, for, for years before that. And um, yeah, that's about it. All right, Chris? Yeah, uh, not much to add I, uh, other than that uh, yeah, I've been working with data for a long time and interested to see these new trends emerging uh, and happy to talk about them. Um, and you guys are based in Singapore. That's right. Yes. Very cool. Um, so tell me about, tell me about your, your company, how you came up with the idea and, and what do you do? Uh, okay, are sure. You? So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a brief uh, intro about our company. And uh, I think Chris will probably have uh, a couple of things to, to, to add to that. So um, we have been servicing like e-commerce players, uh, fintechs, uh, banks, uh, in, 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 in medtech space, uh, in, in mainly in the data, space, data DevOps space. But we always notice a common, common problem of uh, there being too many disparate databases and the need to actually really get that data into one single place. But that process takes years uh, to, to actually centralize the data. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, I was just, just, just to add that the product came out of, uh, of that. And it's, um, I think there's a general um, uh, movement that's happening that, it, it, you know, this data mesh uh, article took off um, because it's, uh, uh, expressing a lot of what we've been feeling in the industry for a while. So unpack that. Like what, what, what sentiment have you seen that kind of drives the, the data mesh story forward? Yeah, so there, there seems to be this frustration inside of every client that we work with that they can't get to the data quickly enough. And when they do, um, they're often seeing it um, uh, there, it's not matching up with uh, the explanation from the people who are responsible for the data. So they'll, if they talk to the engineers, they'll get a different answer than what they get from analysts. Uh, and, it, and it feels like an industry sort of in crisis. And I, I'd say that um, the feeling with data mesh, it, it feels a lot to me like the, um, when Agile uh, first came on the scene and there was a manifesto, like there has to be a better way of doing things. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it feels like, yeah. It's interesting, right? We've seen tons of investment in data warehousing, data lakes, you know, we've seen iteration after iteration, haven't really made a lot of progress, right? Um, I think it's interesting to see kind of what, what this data mesh concept might, might actually do, you know, despite companies coming into the space and having tremendous valuations, um, I don't get the sense that a lot of problems are getting solved. 
So for your product, uh, I think, what is it called? Edge, edge set? Edge set. Edge set. All right. So how, how does edge set help to resolve some of these challenges? What does your product do? Sure. So edge set uh, presents all of the data sources inside of your company as a single virtual SQL database. So if you're familiar with something like Presto, um, Spark to some extent, there's, there's some other tools that are sort of emerging right now in the market. There's this realization that let's get rid of this upfront ETL and this multi-month or multi-year effort of putting everything into a data warehouse and just push the queries out to where the data is. But it sounds like data virtualization. Essentially, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so how, how does this fit into the, the data mesh story? What, what makes a product unique? Yeah, so the, um, the thing that, I, I guess the biggest difference um, from what I've seen of data mesh, uh, I, I think it's compatible, but by focusing on SQL, it leads to a sort of um, open source approach to the data products. So if you build the data product in the application, um, this is great, but analysts don't get to see what's actually going on. They see the output, but they don't see how the output maps to the raw data. And so by putting everything in, in SQL, um, building up these data products as views, uh, the analysts can see, they can go down to the source uh, by, by examining the views if they want. And I think it leads to more collaboration between the analysts and the people who are producing the data with their application. Um, that, that's one difference. Um, I think the other difference by using data virtualization, we're doing less upfront work, um, which has its trade-offs, but uh, rather than sort of imposing the, um, uh, the data product building work upfront, we say, you know, let, let's just get the data centralized. First, we can build the data product as this sort of analytical plane evolves. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think that gives us a little bit more agility and uh, yeah, it, it, it solves some of the roadblocks, I think, um, that we see in common between, the, between a sort of a data mesh approach, which has a lot of advantages over a traditional data warehouse, but still shares some of the, I think, problems that we see in our customers where um, there's a big upfront effort. So you talked about the upfront effort I think the trade-off in, in data virtualization stories is a, is a performance hit, right? I think, yes. you know, there's, there's always been this kind of like data virtualization sounds awesome, but it's super slow. And if your data doesn't map correctly to the virtualization layer, or if the data changes, things get brittle pretty quickly. How does edge set help with that stuff? So we address it a few ways. One is by um, using materialized views where they're necessary. So if you have a very slow query that, that just, um, or a very slow view that's used by a lot of other queries or used by a lot of analysts, then mm -hmm. you can set that up to be refreshed on a schedule that you like. And the nice thing about that is that each of these can be granular on their refresh schedule rather than having an entire ETL process that everything has to happen at the same time. Um, and, and the issue with that is often that you start overrunning your 24 hour window. That's, that's one way. Um, another way is that uh, a, a big objection, of course, with virtualization is not just the performance, but also the load you put on the data sources. So we have some intelligence and, and monitoring uh, in the tool that, uh, that, that will back off on a data source if it starts to see latency or other metrics degrading while it's working on that. And this is, this is probably the biggest pushback we get from DBAs and DevOps uh, who are evaluating edge set. They're worried that this is gonna overload their data sources. And then I'd say, uh, finally, for some companies, there's just not a, there's just not a choice. You know, they're, they're, they're producing too much data uh, across different data sources that, they, uh, that, that putting it all in one place is really not an option given the bandwidth that they have uh, between their data sources and the data warehouse, especially in multi-country setups. That's a good point. I mean, you know, all, all these, you know, not just the, 
the amount of data, but the, the rules and laws and, and regulations that are kind of getting wrapped around data today makes it hard to move stuff around. Um, does, yeah. does Edge Set have kind of capabilities for, you know, cross-border data analysis or, or movement when, when relevant? What does that look like? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because the laws here in Asia are still um, ha are being, have been tested even less than the ones in Europe and North America, right? So we're not fully sure how these are going to be interpreted on, you know, is, is, is an aggregate result that's pulled across borders, does that count as uh, against these data privacy laws? Um, but where we can help with that is by um, automatically inferring and masking uh, what, what appears to be personally identifiable information. So another big pushback we get is from the security side. Okay, putting all our data in one place this seems like it's a, a security problem, right? Where, where everybody's gonna have access to raw data. Um, so, uh, so, so we assist with that, with that the, the seemingly insurmountable for some companies task of, of going through all their data and flagging which stuff, which is too sensitive for analysts to access directly, you know, national ID numbers and, and, and so on, and uh, assist with that so that they have more confidence in sharing it. And, and going as far as saying, okay, only this group has access to that raw data. The others can can use it in aggregate, but not um, in detail. So, but uh, again, yeah. I, it's really evolving, yeah. And, and to add on to that, I, I think a great question, Nick. Uh, so what we see in, uh, in, in Asia and Singapore is that uh, we have quite a few global FinTechs, uh, unicorns that have headquartered in Singapore, but they have mm -hmm. operations in nine, 10 different countries, including in China. And the, one, the most recent uh, uh, you know, development is, is the China's data, data security law and data privacy law. Uh, so we have seen a strong interest from uh, unicorns in, in China who actually have that kind of uh, protection and security. Interesting. So in addition to the, the, the governance aspect, the virtualization aspect, I think you guys did a good job uh, explaining that. Um, is there anything around like data discovery, right? I think once you create a, a materialized view, it's, it's kind of static. It's hard to find other stuff that's out there. Does edge set play a role in, in the discovery or is that something that has to happen prior to engaging your solution? I think, uh, so we're, we have a feature in development. It's not in the product yet, um, but customers seem to be interested in that. And that is a data heat map. So since um, access to the different data sources uh, passes through EdgeSet, we can see which, which tables, which columns are participating in queries, and we can count those and then show a heat map of the catalog. What are people looking at, right? Because by, by reducing, you know, it can be daunting to go in and see hundreds or thousands of tables across different data sources. Um, but by reducing that to showing, okay, people are looking at this, maybe you should look here first, that, that's one. Another is allowing uh, analysts to put shared comments onto the data sources at the, at, the, at the data source or the schema or the table or column level so that they can share pointers. Um, other than that, it's really up to the people in the company to collaborate. We, we just provide some tools to, to help with that, but hopefully between the tools and the raw data access, they can find their way. So on the on the tool side, are there um, are like social elements, right? Like, can I can I share my favorite columns? Like, are there collaboration capabilities within Edge Set, or is that something that would be done outside of the product? Uh, we're we're planning that uh, a feature that's in development right now is just the start of it, and that's shared queries. So uh, allowing to save a query and set it either as you know, private or or public or shared within your group. And uh, maybe we'll take that further and allow people to vote on, on the queries or just show a usage count so that just like in a news aggregator, the, the most used rise to the top. Yeah. Got it, got it. Um, on the customer side, right? I mean, you guys have been around for a few years. Uh, what kind of, of industries are, are using edge set today? You mentioned financial services. I think med tech is, is another one. Uh, who else is out there? The customers that speak to us most, and maybe Ian can expand on this, are the ones that are concerned about data privacy. Um, since we offer on-premise or private cloud deployment, 
this is, I think, who finds it the most interesting because they have compliance that they have to uh, deal with, often very tight compliance. So Inghan mentioned earlier fintech and banks. Another one that, that sees the value in, in this on-premise option is uh, the med techs. So they have pac private patient records. That's, mm -hmm. that's where we're focused right now. Okay, got it. And so you, know, you, you mentioned some of the challenges that they face around data privacy. Is, is there anything else you wanna add on that to, to kind of unpack what kind of challenges they're having? I mean, you know, we've been throwing technology at data problems for 40 years, I think, 50 years, maybe longer. Um, and no one's really resolving the people problem, right? Tech is easy, right? We want, everybody wants to just write a check and say, I've solved the problem, I bought this thing. Um, but, you know, what are you doing from kind of the, the cultural transformation that's required to kind, of, to kind of make this stuff work, right? I mean, Data Mesh is all about keeping context local to the groups that understand the data that, that they have, rather than trying to say, we're gonna put everything in a centralized place and, and kind of hope for the best. So beyond the data privacy, right? What's happening from the collaboration side? You mentioned some features that are in development, um, but I, I question if that goes, you know, not far enough, right? I mean, there's gotta be some other issues you guys are, are encountering and how are you tackling those? Sure. Yeah, so we're, we're not at this point taking a prescriptive approach to um, how people should use it. And I agree that that's, um, an issue inside of these these companies. How, how do you share data without going too far to either extreme of just not sharing anything or, or risking uh, a leak? Um, uh, but I, I don't think we're, uh, we're, we're not gonna try to solve every problem. What we, what we are doing is giving a, uh, is emphasizing giving a secure by default context, right? So by, inferring all of the data sources, uh, the schemas and the um, likeliness that a, a certain column contains personally identifiable information, we can give a safe default, right? So this is secure by default. This is like an open BSD slogan where you, know, you install the server and you may have to customize it, but you at least know that it's not gonna be you know, remotely exploited as soon as you put it out there. And I think we're looking for the same experience. You install EdgeSet and at least when you give people access to it, they're not, you know, you don't have a big data leak problem on your hands. And then you go from there, you know, examine and decide what you're going to open up, whoever's responsible for it. And to help with that, we built uh, visual tools for granting access so that you're not relying on a DBA to uh, type in grant commands. It'll, you know, the people who need to grant the access can, can do it through a visual interface. But that's- You're pushing that down to the people who understand the data. Right. And, right. and, yeah, I have, I, have, I have a couple of things to add to that. I mean, this, this, this is really great. I think, the, uh, I think what you're really pointing out, it's the data culture and the skill sets that's needed. Of course, uh, tools like uh, each set, it's, it's trying to make it easier for, uh, for non-technical people to use, uh, to, to manipulate data. But um, I think there's a huge push. And, and, and just yesterday, we, we had a very extremely good meeting with the Singapore government on how to make uh, data skills more common to the general populace and as well as how to build that data culture. So the Singapore government is just trying to encourage that the data culture to be on the, on the, on the, on the not, not only at a company level, but actually at the nation level. And I think that's some pretty awesome stuff. No, that, that is that is pretty cool. Uh, you know, we're seeing in, in uh, a, a friend of mine, Valerie Logan. She she's a big proponent of of data literacy, right? And kind of understanding and, and sharing. You know, like do, do you think in data is the way that she describes it. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot more push for that, right? And you know, you can go pretty far with 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 that kind of of story, especially if you push it at a national level. Um, so when it comes to like your sales process, right? What kind of roles are you guys targeting within organizations? Is it DBAs? Is it chief data officers? Is it, is it, or is it some other role? Um, from a product perspective, uh, we're targeting anyone in the company who either knows SQL or can learn SQL. So th this is often the analysts or the data scientists who, or they're usually the direct managers who um, uh, 
are frustrated by roadblocks getting getting the data that they need. Um, but uh, Ying Han can talk more about at the executive level, you know, who, who we end up talking to. Ying Han. Yeah, I think it's really a 360 kind of uh, sales. So we, we have to engage with uh, the CTOs, the, people, the DBAs that are actually using it. Uh, we have to engage with the business stakeholders, the, the, the people who are really digesting the data and, and actually want very rapid insights uh, down to kind of different, different department heads. So it's, it's not, it hasn't been easy. Yeah, you're right. It's yeah, not, and, right? And I mean, you're talking, about, you're talking about half a dozen, maybe a dozen different roles that all have to buy into this idea. Chris, I'm sorry. I think I interrupted you. Yeah, no. It's and and often the the roles that we we have to talk to and the most and and answer the most objections from is the ones who are closest to the data. Uh, usually, DevOps, the DBAs, and and the engineers who are responsible for it. Often, you know, the engineers are responsible for the operations of their microservices and applications. And uh, from their perspective, you know, they have little to gain and very much to lose. Um, because their KPIs, their metrics are not about their data products, which, which is, I, I, I'm very hopeful that, that data mesh as it catches on sort of shifts that um, perspective for management so that we're not in a position where engineers feel like it's, uh, it, it, you know, they can't win by uh, building data products because it's not going to, uh, it's not, it's not going to help how they're evaluated in the company. That's a great point. I mean, you know, everybody's got their own KPIs. They're all evaluated differently. Um, and you need some kind of, you know, just going back to the cultural aspect, right? Everybody's got to have, you know, be aligned on, on what objectives they, the, the organization needs to accomplish. And that has to trickle down to the individual team level. Um, are there any specific customer stories you wanted to share? You don't have to give company names or anything like that. Industries are fine. Um, but any like really compelling, like, you know, stories that, that other people might want to know about. Yeah, I, I'll share one. It was a, a, a large company in Southeast Asia that's operating in multiple countries. And this was back when we were just kind of testing the concept and finding our feet with the product and, and realizing um, how useful it would be. And they went from, um, they, they had their own OLTP systems in each country. Uh, and own BI teams in some case in each country and own analysts and engineers. And uh, uh, last we checked in, they had over 300 users with access to the system. Uh, and, and it had these effects that we didn't anticipate. Um, again, this was an early uh, case where the, you, you could see that, that at the executive, the manager, the, the BI level, um, or at the data analyst level, their vocabulary started to shift from industry you know, standard terms to more specific to their uh, data sources. So the terms that the engineers were using were starting to bubble up to the analyst level. Um, another thing we saw we didn't expect was, the, was query sharing. So you can imagine for over 300 people, how do they all know SQL, right? They, they generally don't, but they would share the queries among each other and they would learn by being able to, they were motivated enough to see, okay, which part of the query do I need to modify to slightly adjust my question? And it sort of led to data literacy sort of um, evolving in the, in the company to some extent um, because the, the demand was there and they had access. They just needed to figure out the next step. Uh, and then the other big effect was there was a decrease um, in, in feature requests for operational software. And this was another sort of unexpected consequence where um, a feature that may have needed to be developed for uh, a warehouse management system uh, was deprioritized because the warehouse was able to get by with some queries that they had you know, gotten an engineer to help them make that they could run themselves through the tool. So uh, I think it was a very interesting, a very, uh, it, it really shifted my perspective on, on how data really uh, enables uh, different things inside of a company. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good story. I mean, honestly, you know, that's kind of like the holy grail of, of what you want to happen when you start adopting these tools. Um, so you're, you're based in Singapore. So I was going to ask you, know, one of the questions on my list here is, is where is it available? I imagine because you're in Asia, it's primarily available on-prem. You mentioned private cloud earlier. 
Um, but other than on-prem, private cloud, are, are, do you have a, a cloud offering? Is there a SaaS offering available today? Uh, we don't have a hosted uh, offering available other than to existing uh, uh, service uh, clients that, that, that we're helping out with. But um, we just recently uh, have pushed uh, AMIs to every um, uh, Amazon region. Um, we can make a Docker image available, uh, ship an ISO image and so on. Um, definitely currently time zone could be a bit of an issue if we're, if we're working with a, uh, a company in, in maybe North America or Europe, but we, we work with developers uh, around the world. So we're, we're pretty used to being a global company. Right. Um, right. Yeah, and, and we'll be probably moving more into the marketplaces uh, and not just AWS as well as uh, Azure marketplace and, and so on. And then is, is there a cloud that you're is there a cloud that your prospects and customers are, are, are predominantly gravitating to? They are predominantly on AWS, we notice. Um, however, some of them have data sources that must live on Alibaba cloud or on another China specific uh, host. So we've actually built uh, Alibaba OSS connector and probably will be building more uh, for those companies that have to have certain data hosted there. Got it. So if people want to know more about EdgeSet and, and, and you guys, uh, where can they find you? They can go to www.tetmon, T-E-T-M-O-N.com. All right. Um, and you're on, I imagine, all the socials as well? I'm not sure about that yet. Ihan, are we on a... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we've had some, time to set some. up our... So. Some? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. I know. Good I know. Yinghan is quite active on our LinkedIn, but uh, the other ones, I'm not so sure. All right. Well, we'll put. A, I'll. Uh, I'll make sure we get a link to to your site in uh, in the show notes. Um, all right. Any any closing thoughts? Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything you guys want to share? Uh, I'll leave that to Yinghan. I think I've talked long enough. Fair enough. I, I, I feel that the data mesh movement. It's, it's really it's very in line with that data democracy that we are seeing in, in, in that's coming coming up. And, and it's really, for me as a non-technical user and a non-technical founder, it, it, it's super exciting to be able to actually have all these uh, people there being able to manipulate and, and understand data. So I, I think the data mesh movement, uh, it's, definitely, it's definitely in the right direction. Good stuff. All right, gentlemen. Well, once again, thank you. You're my first interview. So this is, you know, you'll always be able to, to put that on your resume and LinkedIn profile. Uh, but I really want to thank you for your time. Uh, we'll get this posted soon. And if there's anything else I can, I can do to help, feel free to reach out. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks, Nick. All right.